it's just like a white desert for as far as you can see there is absolutely nothing and you come back and it's overwhelming between 2016 and 2018 dr tim heitland spent 14 months in antarctica as part of a 12-person german research team when he returned to regular life things felt different the first thing i did was like hugged a tree being away from the icy continent felt normal after a few days but one thing still didn't feel right being surrounded by people. There was a feeling that lasted for a long time, really long, easily more than a year. Throughout Heitland's journey, a team of researchers studied the doctor and his colleagues to pinpoint the effects of long-term isolation. Their most striking finding was that nearly all of the explorers' brains physically changed. Isolation has profound effects on us. Scientists are only beginning to understand the full scope of these changes, and they're doing cutting-edge research to discover if and how we can overcome them. Because although humans didn't evolve to live in isolation, many of us are beginning to spend more and more time alone, and that could be a big problem. Being in Antarctica is very different from normal life. You get a lot of hurricane force uh, storms, and in the beginning it frightens you. <laughs> People like in our first storm, we've, we've been sitting in the station and sometimes it starts to shake. And then it's a place of total, absolute silence. Living in such a stark environment profoundly alters the brain. Over the course of 14 months, most of Heitland's crew lost volume in part of the hippocampus, a region involved in spatial navigation, learning, and emotional processing. This is especially for us interesting because this does something to do with your memory, we do not know for the moment what is lost there. Dr. Hans Christian Gunga was one of the researchers leading the study. Although his team's data doesn't show exactly what faculties the expeditioners lost, they found changes similar to what you'd expect to see in patients with depression or Alzheimer's disease. It was so significant that Gunga wondered if they'd made a mistake. When you compare that to the post-traumatic stress syndrome, they have, in some time, not so strong changes as these guys they're down in, in Antarctica. These kinds of neurological changes can have major effects on behavior. In 2018, shortly after Heitland returned from his 14-month mission, another Antarctic expeditioner stabbed one of his crewmates, who was annoying him by spoiling the endings to books. A spoiler alert almost turned deadly. The problem isn't Antarctica but isolation. In February, a group of researchers published an analysis of more than 3,000 studies on the psychological effects of quarantine. They found extremely high rates of PTSD among people who'd previously been quarantined, whether for SARS or equine influenza. Solitary confinement also leads to high prevalence of PTSD and depression. These trauma-related disorders strongly suggest underlying brain damage. And the latest animal research shows the damage extends far beyond the hippocampus. I became really interested in social isolation because I was kind of drawn to um, increases in violence that seem to be occurring more in our society. Dr. Moriel Zelikowski studies the science of fear and aggression. Really, one of the ways you get this huge increase in violence is having um, these increases in social isolation. And that's kind of true across a variety of species. While doing her postdoctoral research at Caltech, Zelikowski and her team isolated mice for two weeks and then studied changes in their behavior and brain function. They focused their study on a specific molecule called TAC2 that triggers stress response. The goal is to really tie um, this increase in TAC2 to functional changes in behavior related to social isolation. When an animal is exposed to stress, TAC2, and potentially a host of additional molecules, signal a stress response across the brain. So when the mice are kept in isolation and the stress persists, the animals start acting skittish and aggressive. When Zelikowski's team started looking at mouse brains, they expected to find elevated levels of TAC2 in specific parts of the brain, like the amygdala, which handles fear. Instead, they found TAC2 in numerous regions across the brain. When they tagged the molecule with a green fluorescent compound, the effect was so dramatic, you could see it without a microscope. Unlike a single traumatic event or some memory being stored in a particular part of the brain, what seemed to happen with isolation is many different parts of the brain were affected, some of which weren't even really connected to each other. Zelikowski and her team believe some of those clusters of elevated TAC2 explain extremely abnormal behaviors that persist after isolation, 
like irrational fears and violent behavior. They did find proactive ways to make the isolation less damaging and reverse its effects, but it's hard, if not impossible, to re-socialize mice once they've been isolated, because they're so violent. All of this paints a pretty grim picture of isolation, but some experts argue that's missing a huge part of the story, because many people say confinement experiences change their lives for the better. <laughs> there you are. This is Jack Stuster, an anthropologist who spent decades helping NASA make life in space more livable. In 2003, he began the longest running experiment on the International Space Station, analyzing confidential journals astronauts kept while in space. Stuster says the journals provide unique insight into the minds of astronauts and the many changes they experience while in orbit. In some cases, I learned more than I really wanted to know. I mean, someone going through marriage problems or others who had a difficult time on an orbit with relations with uh, mission control, for example, or problems at home. Many of these problems would seem minor if they weren't magnified by the effects of isolation and the stress it applies to different regions of the brain. You know, in isolation and confinement, one of these things that happens is trivial issues are exaggerated. Little things are blown out of proportion. And yet, Schuster says astronauts and other expeditioners don't end up permanently damaged. He says he's been amazed time and time again how well astronauts adapt to space and then back to life at home. Every one of them who I have met has been exceptional in important ways. And one of the, those ways is that they're resilient. It's important to recognize that resilience is something astronauts are pre-selected for, and they still have to work hard at it. One of the astronauts Duster has studied is Mike Fink, one of NASA's most veteran space flyers, flying on three missions for a total of 381 days in orbit. As soon as we land, we want everything to be the way it was before, and that just doesn't work. Most of the astronaut reintegration process is designed to address the pain of returning from low Earth orbit. We meet with a physical trainer and they work us out the heck out of us uh, so that our muscles and bones uh, come back. But NASA also has a family support team to help astronauts anticipate some of the interpersonal and emotional challenges of returning. Because after a long time away, even minor changes can be jarring. For example, my wife was in charge, and then I came back, and I, I didn't immediately say, no, I'm in charge now. No, that wasn't going to work. I'd be really tired at the end of the day, and, and my wife said, hey, time to take out the trash. <laughs> it's like, well, I guess I'm back. <laughs> Getting back to a normal routine is important for reuniting with family and friends. It also has lots of important health implications. Recent studies suggest the hippocampus is surprisingly resilient, given sufficient exercise combined with a diet rich in antioxidants. Sleep is also incredibly helpful, particularly REM sleep, when researchers believe the hippocampus is forming memories. Meanwhile, researchers like Moriel Zalikowski are exploring possible drug treatments that could protect the brain from isolation-induced damage. Their interventions have shown promising results in mice, though they're still a long way from having something they could bring to humans. Which leaves most experts recommending, at least for now, that people in isolation try to frame it as an opportunity and grow from experiencing a new perspective. It reduces your social relationships totally to, to the core of communicating, of, of getting to know each other, taking care of each other, and trying to have the best possible time together. And um, I think that is totally valuable.